Welcome to lecture eight. This lecture is on time, clocks, and where time is actually coming from. First, um, this will be a little bit of a special lecture. As you can see, I have a lot of different equipment up here. Hopefully, it will all work out the way I think it will work out, but it might be a little tricky. You might see me fumble around. It's a very practical, hands-on um, course. And it has a couple of experiments, and as you might know, and sometimes experiments don't work out the way you want them to. OK, timers. I wanted to clarify what it means that, that if there are different implementation levels of priorities. This is a very good example of two different types. For example, remember you have eight bits for priorities that you can have, but manufacturers don't need to implement all of them. So what it means is that if there are only three bits of priority implemented, so if only the top three bits are implemented, you only have these different priority classes or these different priorities that you can actually, actually have. And then within these priorities, you can still split them up into preemption priorities and group priorities. But you only get three bits, so not very much to work with. If only four bits are implemented, of course, then you get all of these. You get twice as many numbers of priorities that you can then use and implement. Again, the top three ones, you can never change. The reset interrupt, the NMI interrupt, and the hard fall interrupt will always have the same priorities. You cannot change them. Yes? Is there a required minimum? Does require a minimum number of bits? Or? Good question. I don't know. I mean, at some point, it doesn't make any sense anymore. If you like don't implement any of them, then you just don't have any priorities. I'm not sure if that's allowed. It's a, it's a good question. It's possible. I don't think anybody would do that because at some point, I mean, having two bits of priority, it should be fairly easy to implement. Um, I have never seen a microcontroller that has less than three. Um, I'm not, but I'm not sure if that, that's ARM that actually defines that. It could be that they say you have a minimum of three bits that you have to implement. I would have to look it up. OK, today we're going to talk about timers, clocks on the processor. We will talk about the clock system on your smart fusion, which is a very advanced and complicated thing to deal with. Uh, we will talk about how to use time in your embedded systems. And if we have time, we'll go and look into designing of a memory mapped pulse width modulated um, circuitry, which is also what you will have to do in your labs later on. OK. So first, what can we use time for in an embedded system? Or where would you use time in an embedded system? If you want an interrupt at a certain frequency, yes. What could you use that for? Why would you want an interrupt at a certain frequency? Like said, say an interrupt every second, half second. Sorry? If you want to pull something, what, for example? What would you want to pull at a very specific rate? OK. A sensor, right? If you want to take a measurement on something, then you want to pull it, for example, you want to say, I want to measure the light intensity in this room every second. How would you easily do that? Just busy loop as we had last time and keep the processor awake? Probably not. If you, possible, you want to do something else. You want to communicate or do something. And then every second, you want to be reminded that, hey, go and get your temperature measurement or your light <coughs> measurements right now. OK, so measurements. What other things do we need time for? Yes? Motor controls. Motor controls, yes. Like telling how fast the motor should turn around and how fast it should go. Or the other way around, measuring how fast you're going. Right? You need time for that. You need to measure how often is your wheel turning around, and then you can translate that into a speed if you know how big your wheels are. Anything else? Yes? Maybe you want to pressure out a screen? A screen, absolutely. So the inverse of measuring if you want to output something, if you want to generate a signal. So for example, if you want to talk to a display, an analog display, you have a V-sync and an H-sync that you have to synchronize onto so that the display knows where you are at in your line that you want to print right now. Yes? Yes, in real-time OSs, you want to measure how long a task has been running to make sure that other people have a chance to, to operate and other tasks can operate so you can switch them out, right? Very good examples. Yes? Can you use it 
How would you do that? I would time the clock. Okay. Have another line go by at a certain time when you go low at the time of the clock. Mm -hmm. So basically, you could make a signal generator, right, or a frequency generator. Something that one of the instruments I have up front of here has an internal very high speed clock, and then it uses that clock to generate different clock signals or system um, signals themselves, right? So where does time come from? <laughs> where, where does time come from? Yes? A crystal? What is a crystal? A little quartz thing? A little crystal quartz thing? Does it need to be a quartz? No? Sorry? Yes. Uh huh. So a quartz is basically a, a um, very interesting material that if you apply electricity to it, it will deform physically, and if you let go from that, it will spring back into its old form and actually generate electricity from it. Or in other words, and we will look at that in a little bit, it's a filter. So if you apply to it a pulse, it will generate a pulse back for you. And you can use that to actually generate an oscillation. And in the quartz crystals, it's, that it's a very nicely defined and very steady system. What other kind of oscillators do we have? What other oscillators do you know? RC oscillator. RC oscillator, right? Have you ever, like all EEs probably hopefully have done an RC network where we have a resistor and a capacitor to each other, and they start <coughs> oscillating if you set them up right, right? Not a very good oscillation, because what's the kind of typical accuracies you have on resistors and capacitors? 5% is for capacitors is a very good one. You can capacitors get them down to 2%, resistors down to 0.1%, and we will see that 0.1% for time stability is really not very good. Quartz crystals go down to PPMs, or parts per millions. So what's the link between PPMs and percents? So percents is per 100, right? It's a unitless system. You all know how to use it. PPM is parts per million. So how many percent, or 1% is how many parts per million? Sorry? 100,000? 10,000? 1,000? 50? 10,000, no, 10, right? So 10,000, so 1% change is 10,000 ppm. And the typical stability of your crystals is about plus minus 10 ppm. So it's a lot further down there. And that's just a cheap crystal. So what other kind of oscillators do we have? Your crystal is probably what you have in your watch or in your cell phones that gives you time. But do we have other things? Sorry? A pendulum. Yes, also not very accurate device. But yes, it's an oscillation. It's a mechanical oscillation. Anything else? MEMS oscillators. Yes, who was that? Yes, MEMS oscillators. Are you working on MEMS oscillators? No? Okay. MEMS oscillators, so microelectromechanical systems. These are mechanical devices, kind of like almost a pendulum, uh, or actually a quartz, but they are done in silicon. And we can use them these days for oscillators too, become cheap. Yes? Atomic yes, atomic clocks, right? The NIST is running multiple atomic clocks to keep time as accurate as possible. And it's actually a huge network worldwide that they are trying and keeping time um, together. And they, they are defining what the time standard is in the world. So did you guys know that time is actually the most precise thing that we can measure? Like it's the most precise unit that we have in the world. And it so happens that, for example, the meter is defined by the time units that we can have. Do you guys know how? How does the meter, or how is the meter defined by time? Yes? The fraction of, uh, of the distance that light travels. For a certain amount of a cesium clocks, clock ticks. That's exactly right. right. So the meter is actually defined by how accurate we can tell time. And today, we can measure time to very, very high precisions with these atomic clocks. Any questions so far?
Yes. And they are redefining it every now and then. Because we, just a couple of years ago, they developed some new atomic clocks where they got like two orders of magnitude higher precision, so they had to redefine. Well, they didn't redefine the meter, but it so happens that the cesium standard now has inaccuracies that they can measure with this more high accurate clock. So it was defined at a certain precision, so they had to take the new clock, measure the old clock, and see how far this is, and then use the new clock to tell a more precise measurement. So it's like kind of a thing that happens all the time. Does anybody know another unit that's unfortunately changing occasionally, not related to time? The dollar bill. The dollar bill, yes, that one is <laughs> inflating unfortunately very badly. Um, anything else? The kilogram, yes. What is happening to the kilogram? It's fluctuating and it's losing weight apparently. It's very interesting, yeah. So the kilogram is defined by this, I think it's a block of a certain material that's held at a certain constant time at the right height um, and it so happens that it evaporates or something like that there. So it's, it's getting lighter over time. Of course, they're trying to not do that. They want to keep it the same, but that's what happens to these standard blocks um, of, of weight. Okay, so we talked a couple of, a couple of these things. Um, we can use time for scheduling of computation. We had that one. Signal sampling and generation. So, for example, audio signals, recording audio signals, generating audio signals in your iPods and music devices. All done using some time source. Communication, we have not talked about that one. You need time to communicate with somebody else, right? If you want to meet somewhere, you tell somebody, hey, let's meet at 12 o'clock, so we find each other again. So you need, time. you need to be able to tell time at a global scale. If you, your time is different from my time, you might have troubles communicating. And navigation in GPS systems, for example. That's just a global positioning system, which is actually a network of atomic clocks that fly up in space on satellites that are held very precisely at a certain time and using these time signals and measuring when they arrive and what the difference between the arrival is, you can actually find out where you are if you know where the satellites are in space. Okay, here is just a little example um, of where time is extremely important. Right? These are machine robots, fabrication robots from ADB and you can see they are collaborating. Now, most likely they are connected to each other, right, through a cable, but you can see the precision that they are having. In this case, three robots. It's, it's amazing, but you can see where they, you really have to coordinate them at the same time. If one of these robots would have a slightly different time source or a system just being slightly off, what you would see is that in a second they show you a close-up of how precise they're actually moving around on these things. But they have like a millimeter kind of accuracies with which they are moving. So there's not much wiggle room. There's not much wiggle room here that you can have time wrong, or in this case, location. Okay, so how do we generate clocks? Well, we have some sort of resonating element. It can be a quartz crystal, this can be a MEMS resonator, um, or many other things. You can have an inverter ring, right? If you have an inverter, and if you take its output and hook it up to its input, what will happen? It's an inverter, right? Where the output is always the inverse of the input. There's a delay, right? It takes a little bit of time for the output to go what, where the input was. So what will happen is that the output will be at 1, for example. So the input is at 1. So the output becomes 0. So the input becomes 0. So the output becomes 1 and it will start oscillating. That's what's called a ring oscillator. And LC, RC circuits, atomic clocks, and there are a lot more different oscillating sources out there. You then need some so sort of a clock driver. That's a device that's actually driving and making sure that your resonating element keeps resonating. Right? We don't have any perpetual mobiles, so you have to invest some energy into this resonating element to make sure that it keeps resonating. From there, you get a clock signal you can now use a hardware counter in hardware that just keeps counting up. So now you have a system that can count at a very precise frequency and that actually gives you time. And now we have a software interface where you can use from software where you can read this counter or you can set the counter. For example, you can reset it or set it to a certain number where it then will keep start counting. And there's a lot of more interfaces that you usually have into these hardware counters to do something with them. Okay, 
Now comes the fun part, demo time. Let's see if this all works. All right, so this is what actually happens in there. So you have a crystal, and then you have a band which basically acts as a band pass filter, and then you have something that's an amplifier. So what happens initially with a crystal is you, you bang it really hard with very wide noise. This noise gets shaped by feeding back through the bandpass filter, going back in the amplifier, and feeding back in here. So what happens is initially you have a lot of noise. So this is a spectral spectrogram here, right? You have a lot of frequency, and then the filter will get better and better and better and better. And the more accurate this will become, the more precise your crystal or your frequency generator works. And if you ever heard of like the Q factor, the higher the Q, the better your filter is, and the more narrow this whole filter becomes, the more precise your frequency will be defined at. If you have a quartz crystal and you see capacitors on the side, they are just for tuning. And sometimes you have to add some capacitance to it to actually start making ring the whole system. But the accuracy of, of those is not what defines your filtering coefficient. That's really the quartz crystal that's sitting on there. Yes? Yes. Um, yes. I mean, I have never actually seen an AT quartz crystal, but if we go back, so this is an element of a quartz. And then what happens is these are just two different quartz types. So if you cut it this way sliced, then it's what's defined in AT cut quartz. And if you cut it this way sliced, it's called a DT cut, which is a different cut. There are what's so-called SC cuts. There's a Y cut. So there's a lot of different cuts that exist. Basically, crystal manufacturers are trying to figure out the most stable form of a quartz crystal. OK, so now we know the parts of what a resonator is, how they work, how you get a clock signal out of them, I hope. Right? There are lots of different sources, different stabilities that you will get out of them, and it's not always the exact same thing. So next step is clock signals. So now we have a signal. That's a clock, right? That looks, uh, it's, it's gone now, but we saw it over there on the oscilloscope. It goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. What do we do with this now? We somehow have to distribute this clock signal over our system. So we have the resonating element with a driver, a clock signal that's sitting over here. In your smart fusion, you have a fairly complex clock hierarchy architecture. And pretty much every microcontroller has some sort of clock distribution network, configurable, configurable clock systems. The smart fusion is a lot more complicated than on your small little MSP430 that you have. So for example, in the smart fusion, what you have is four different main sources of resonating or clock signals. You have a 32 kilohertz oscillator, the main oscillator, which is about, I think, at 20 megahertz, if I'm not mistaken. And you have an internal RC oscillator. Main oscillator. Sorry? Main yes, main oscillator is an external oscillator, which is, in our case of the Smart Fusion, a crystal oscillator. The difference is 32 kilohertz, low, low frequency. Main oscillator is about at 20 megahertz. And then you have an RC oscillator, which is, again, about at 20 megahertz-ish. The difference is the main oscillator is a lot more stable than the RC oscillator, but the RC oscillator boots up a lot faster than your main oscillator until it basically starts ringing. And then you have an external global I.O. buffer where you can hook up whatever external clock signal you want. You could, for example, hook up an, an oven-controlled crystal oscillator and feed that one into your, your smart fusion. What comes next is a very complex PLL and clock conditioning circuitry. This PLL block allows you to distribute and select different clocks on this side and output them on different clock signals that then go either to your FPGA or to your microcontroller subsystem over here. So you can see it's an extremely dynamic system. And if you look into this block here, this is what's in there. This is your PLL block. Looks very complicated, right? But the concept is fairly easy. What you have is you have a lot of multiplexers that generate different clocks, clock signals, right? You can select the different clock, external clock sources for the clock A signal. And then you have, for example, this particular PLL here. The PLL is, do you guys know what a PLL is? Phase-locked loop. Phase loop. What are they used for usually? Multiplying. Multiplying. 
So a PLL generates a higher clock signal than its input. How does it do it? It has a very fast RC or a ring oscillator inside, and it uses the external clock signal to match that faster loop inside, and making sure that there are always n ticks of the faster clock for every one clock tick that comes in. So that's how a PLL can, can go higher and faster in frequency. Usually you do have in a PLL also a divider. So in this particular case you have a divide and then the PLL we go up. You have a couple of delay loops in here so you can delay certain signals with respect to others if you want to. You have more multipliers. You have some dividers over here so you can divide clock signals back down again. Extremely dynamic and fortunately MicroSemi was nice enough to give you a nicer interface into that. So you don't have to go and set registers here and there and do this and that. You can use this particular clock configuration um, circuitry to configure the different clocks that you have on your system. Again, you have selectors for the different clock inputs, for the different clock signals that we saw before, right? That's basically these multiplexers here. Nice little drop-down menus. You then have the PLL up here where you can select different dividers, it will tell you what the output frequency will be given a certain input frequency. You have more selectors, the delays, etc., etc., until the clocks are actually coming out of this block as the F clock, which is the clock that goes to your microcontroller subsystem. And the F, and not just that, the, wait, yes, it, to the F clock, it goes out to your microcontroller subsystem, and another clock that goes to your 10 megahertz um, Ethernet system. Again, on the left-hand side, input. On the right-hand side, output. Using this dialog, you can configure pretty much anything you want for your different clock systems. Any questions to this? Not yet? Okay. So then, how do we now keep time? So far, we know everything about frequencies, right? They change. But frequencies are just back like ticks. Like that's a digital signal that goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. How do we keep time? Count, yes. You just count how many clock ticks you get. And that's just a digital counter. So if you feed this signal into a counter that just increments by one for every clock tick, you can now count at a certain frequency. So how do we now keep time? You can count at a certain frequency. How do you know what one second is? So assume you have a 32.768 clock that comes in, you have to count for 32.768 ticks to get one second. It's really not that hard to make this division. Sometimes it becomes a little bit harder exactly to do the reverse, but it's still, it's just some division and some multiplication with the right clock frequency. So now comes the trick. What if the frequency is not stable? Right? You saw I, I was able to change the frequency on this 32 kilohertz clock crystal by a couple of hertz. What's the implications on that? A second, not a second. Exactly. A second becomes not a second. Right. So it, you really have to be careful what is your clock source when what is your requirement at the end. For example, you can easily use an RC oscillator to run your microcontroller CPU core because it really doesn't matter if you make 100,000 calculations or 101,000 calculations a second. Of course, you want to be faster if possible, but the difference is not that bad. However, if you communicate with somebody else and you're off by a couple of milliseconds, it could mean that you don't hear the other person or that you don't understand them because they talk on a different frequency and you just don't find them. Right? So it really depends on what you want to do and depending on that, you have to search and use different clock uh, sources. Yes? There's the issue that uh, like with the GPS Gravity influences the way time is kept and Yes, the relativity theory and stuff. Fortunately, don't worry about it on your embedded systems. It's at the level where, yes, in atomic clocks and very high precision stuff, gravity actually starts to matter. Um, and not just gravity matters. Stuff that actually impacts a lot more is acceleration. Vibration, for example, can be very dangerous for your clocks because you can have jitters and spurious frequencies that start and appear. Um, what else do we have? Pressure changes, voltage changes can happen, and of course in the temperature. So if you, there are a lot of different sources of errors that can happen in your embedded system. 
Um, but most of the time, you're good with a quartz crystal oscillator unless you start to do some really serious synchronization stuff or communication stuff. Okay, so we keep time in a hardware counter. And then, of course, you have to have logic and software around it that uses this hardware counter to do something with the time itself. Oh, first forgot his phone is now calling something. Okay, in, this, in the Smart Fusion itself, we have multiple different timer sources. So we have multiple counters. The first one is, oops, yeah, the first one is what's called a watchdog timer. This watchdog timer is a very simple 32-bit down counter. So it can count from a certain number down to zero. And because it's a watchdog, what happens is if it reaches zero, it will throw either a non-maskable interrupt or it resets your whole system. That's the watchdog timer. Any idea what this could be used for? Self-destruct. Self Almost, yeah. No, it's, it's very similar, yes. Correct. So the watchdog timer will count down, and if it reaches, reaches zero, well, you froze. Because what you have to do is, you have to tell the watchdog timer always, over and over again to be like, hey, please, uh, reset, 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 reset. Because if it, you once don't tell it to reset, you lock down, something bad happened, and your system will reboot. Very simple. You have the Sysstick timer. The Sysstick timer is a 24-bit down counter. And it's usually used to generate system clock ticks. The nice part about this is any, every, every Cortex-M3, or I think even every Cortex system, actually has this particular SysTick timer. It exists, it always sits on the same memory locations on each and every system. So it's a way for ARM to tell and give you resources. If you want to implement an operating system, you can rely on this SysTick timer to be there on every Cortex-M3 system. It doesn't have much functionality. Um, 24 bits has um, its own interrupt, which is kind of nice, so you don't use up any other interrupt that you have out there. And it's, but it only can use the F clock, so the microcontroller clock, and has a divi an optional divider that it can use to go slower than the microcontroller itself. But that's about it. There's not much else that you can do with this timer, except generating an interrupt at a certain period of time. We usually use in operating systems to do the task scheduler, for example. The Smart Fusion has a couple of other timers. Um, what's, one of them is called the real-time counter, or RTC system. This is the counter that's actually hooked up to a, the 32 kilohertz clock crystal. It's a low-frequency clock. It has 20, 40 bits of a match register, and it can have a divider of up to 128. So the lowest frequency you can count at is 256 hertz. So you can generate with this RTC an interrupt every very long interval, because it has 40 bits, so it's a high number that it can have. It's a low frequency that it clocks at, so you can interrupt, for example, every hour if you want with this system. This is the kind of system that you use if you want to go to sleep for a whole day, for example. You're going to put your system to sleep, and you just wait, turn on the RTC, save a lot of energy, wait until this interrupt happens 24 hours later. You boot up, do something, and go back to sleep and wait until it interrupts again. You also have the timers themselves. So there is two 32-bit timers, system timers. These are the timers we looked at a little bit before in the memory map I.O. These are now a lot more powerful than all the other timers. So who really cares of what a timer can do? Right, we now saw four different timers, right? a watchdog timer, RTC, SysTick, and the more powerful timers that embedded systems have. Why do we have so many different timers? Sorry? Yes, so you can do different things. And the two things you really want to do with a timer is a capture and a compare. These are the two main functionalities more powerful timers will provide you. So the system timers will do that for you. They have captures and compare units. What are they used for? Well, a capture can, for example, be used to measure time. So if you have, for example, a fan and the fan rotates, and you can say every rotation you capture the time that your counter has right now. And then by the delta you get between two of these captures, you can measure how many clock ticks you had. Knowing the frequency of your counter, you know what the speed of your fan is. 
A compare example would be, for example, a PWM system. So a compare is a system where you say, I want an interrupt at a certain time, and when your counter reaches that time, you generate an interrupt or do something. That's a compare functionality. So capture is reading the time when something external happens, while compare is setting a time when you want to be interrupted so you can do something else. These are the two main functionalities timers have. Now, we are almost done, so I really just briefly want to touch on this because this is what will have happen in, I think, lab five on your timers. You never have enough timers on your embedded systems, period. You always run out of timers. It's just one of these things. Timers are, you always need more timers than there are on your embedded system. So one way of dealing with that is you can virtualize your timers in software. So you can have multiple functions that you sign up for and say, I want to be interrupted or you should call this particular function every 10 seconds. You can should call this particular function every 5 seconds, this particular function every 100 milliseconds. And then what happens in your interrupt service routine of your timer, you have to keep track of which functions have to be called at what time. But in software you can deal and virtualize one timer having a lot of different service routines in software itself by making a linked list and a couple of other things. And that's what you will do in lab 5, where you will virtualize one of your timer units. Okay, that would be it.